someone walked up to you and asked you, are you happy, what would you say? Would you tell the truth? Would you lie? Would you ignore them? What would you do? Someone asked me that question a few years ago, and I didn't know what to say. I had just finished giving a keynote to a group of leaders about how to build thriving cultures at work, and a woman in the audience came up to me and pulled me aside and looked at me in the face and asked me that question. Are you happy? If I had been honest with her, I would have said, no, I'm not happy. I got four hours of sleep last night, and I'm completely exhausted, and I really don't want to be here right now, and I feel stuck and overwhelmed and frustrated, and I can't keep these thoughts from spinning around in my head. And the funny thing is, I've been giving these presentations about building thriving cultures at work and the secrets to happiness, but I haven't been thriving or happy myself. But I didn't say that. I lied to her. I told her I was fine, because at that moment, silencing myself felt safer than telling the truth. I wish I'd known then to ask myself the questions I'm going to be asking you today, and I wish I'd had the courage to be honest with myself about the answers. I wish I'd known then what silencing myself was costing me, and I wish I'd known then how to unmute myself. About a year and a half earlier, I was in my doctor's office, and he said five words to me that no high-achieving person ever wants to hear. Maybe you're doing too much. I was in his office in the first place because a month earlier, I had a dream I was drowning, and I started having trouble with my memory. So I'd be in conversation with people, and I would just completely lose my words. Like, I'd forget what I wanted to say in the middle of a sentence, and it happened over and over and over and over again, and I was only 32 years old, so I was really concerned about this. So I went home, and I thought about what my doctor said, and then I did what a lot of us do when our doctor gives us advice. I completely ignored it, and I ended up right back in that doctor's office on Valentine's Day, four months later, when I was supposed to be at a romantic dinner with my husband, and I was really sick. I was sicker than I've ever been. I could barely keep my eyes open. I remember sitting across from my doctor, and he looked at me with kindness and compassion. And he said, would you say this was brought on by work or that you brought this on yourself? You know, I wanted to blame my job like I think a lot of us would, but I knew that wasn't the honest answer. I knew that I had brought this on myself because for my whole life, I only let people see a certain version of me, the one that was accomplished and impressive and independent. I silenced myself when I was struggling because that's what good little girls do. I was afraid to be vulnerable with people and to let them in and to open up and to share what I was feeling because I was the director of well-being for my company. (laughs) And I felt like I had to be this put-together version of myself all the time, even though I was sick with mono and completely burned out. So I wondered. Was I the only person going through something like this? Was I the only person who was afraid to express what I really thought and felt and needed and wanted? Was I the only person putting this kind of pressure on myself to act like I had it all together on the outside when I was falling apart inside? It turns out that a lot of people experience what I was experiencing. This suppression of expression is what author and psychology professor Dana Jack calls self-silencing. When we silence ourselves, we're internally restricting certain thoughts and feelings and actions, and we become who we think people expect us to be, even if it means betraying ourselves. It's like we lose our sense of who we are. We hide certain emotions like anger and sadness and frustration because we don't want to cause any trouble or conflict in our relationships. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to bother or inconvenience anybody. And so we get really, really good at being cooperative, compliant, quiet. But there's a cost to doing that. There's a cost to living that way, to silencing ourselves. And Dana Jack and other researchers who have studied self-silencing across genders and cultures They found that self-silencing is linked to higher levels of disconnection and dissatisfaction in our close relationships, and that people who self-silence are more likely to deal with mental health symptoms 
like depression and anxiety. Over the past couple of years, I've heard from over 800 working professionals, and they've shared with me ways that they're silencing themselves at work. What I found is that their responses aren't just related to how we do this at work, it's also how we do it at home. And the most common theme that I saw across their responses is that self-silencing is rooted in fear. Fear of conflict, failure, judgment, rejection, being wrong, looking selfish, not being good enough. We silence ourselves because of self-doubt and a lack of self-confidence and self-worth. We silence ourselves to protect and to preserve and to maintain our most important relationship. And there's something interesting I learned about that from Dr. Gabor Mate, who's a physician whose work focuses on the intersection of trauma, addiction, stress, and development. And he says that from the time that we're young, from the time we're little, we have a decision to make. We can be in attachment, so we can be in close connection or bond with other people, or we can be authentic. We can acknowledge and act on our thoughts and feelings and needs. But most of us choose attachment over authenticity because our need to be in connection is fundamental to our survival. But our need to be authentic is not. And so we set aside who we really are and what we really think and what we really need and what we really want and what we really feel just so that we can be in relationship with other people. Now, most of us don't realize we're doing this, and we don't realize the price we're paying for it either. So today, I'm going to ask you a series of questions to help you connect to how you are silencing yourself in your life so that you can find the courage to unmute yourself. The first question I want to invite you to sit with is this. What is the cost of you silencing yourself? What's it costing you? You can think about this in terms of your relationships, your career, your creative expression, your physical health, your mental health, your emotional health. What is it costing you? What are you missing out on in your life because you're silencing yourself? Connection, fulfillment, happiness, joy. What are you missing out on? What are you missing? So many of us silence ourselves and, and pay the price for it at work. And a few years ago, I was doing a training for a group of project managers at a global consulting firm. And one of the women who attended reached out to me afterwards online and said she'd made this huge change in her life. But I thought to myself, gosh, what'd you do? It's only been two days. <laughs> she said that she was a single mom and she had to split her time between a location near where she lived and then another one a few states away. And so she had to travel back and forth and back and forth for work. And it was really taking a toll on her and she wasn't able to be home with her family the way that she wanted to be. She said there was a question I asked her in the session. It was a question I had been asked a year earlier. And she felt so convicted by this question, she took it home and talked to her partner about it, and that's what prompted her to make this change. And that question, and the second question I want to offer you today, is this. Who gets the best of you? Who gets the rest of you? Who gets your best? And who gets the rest? Who gets what's left? The next day, that woman went to her boss to ask for a change in her role so she could be taken off of the travel part of her job and just be based where she lived. That was a brave thing for her to do that. That woman could have done what so many of us do, and she could have silenced herself and just kept going with the way things were, and she could have betrayed herself and the people that she loved for the sake of her job and other people's approval. But she didn't do that. She was brave. She spoke up, she asked for what she wanted, and her boss said yes. I'll never forget the last line of the message that woman sent me after she'd made that bold move. She said, Rachel, I slept better last night than I have in a year. We don't always realize what silencing ourselves is costing us and the people we love. There's always a cost. I didn't realize it until I got sick. The year I burned out and got mono, I missed my niece's second birthday party because I was sick at home on the couch. And I remember laying there as my husband is sending me pictures and videos from the party, and I was looking at my phone, thinking to myself, this is not what I want my life to look like. This isn't it. My husband and I didn't make up our Valentine's dinner until May. And I remember sitting across from him at the table, and I reached out to hold his hand. And for the, for the first time all year, I asked him, I said, how are you doing? 
He's not someone who gets openly emotional, but in that moment I could see his eyes fill up with tears and he said, it's been hard. It's been really hard. How is self-silencing affecting your most important relationship? What's it costing you? Who gets the best of you? Who gets the rest of you? A few years ago, I had the opportunity to get another perspective shift from a mentor of mine. Danny Friedland was a doctor of internal medicine, someone who was active in the conscious capitalism and conscious leadership movement. And he was one of those people that, that had this zest and this joy for life. He was so alive and animated. And so I was shocked when I found out in the fall of 2020 that he had been diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. I was part of a community of facilitators that he was a leader in at the time. And he shared with us a question he would ask himself when he noticed he was going into this place of stress and fear and anxiety. It's the third question I want to offer you today, and it's this. What matters most now? What matters most now? His response to that question was, make every moment count. Be intensely alive in loving relationships and view every interaction as a touch point to give and receive love. And that is how he lived his life until his last breath. He passed away less than a year later, and he was only 56 years old. But his words stuck with me. Make every moment count. When we're silencing ourselves, when we're holding back what we want or think or need or feel, because for whatever reason, we've decided that everybody else's needs and thoughts and wants and feelings are more important than ours and that we don't matter as much, we are not making the moment count. We're not. And we're going to end up living a life of resentment and regret instead of a life of fulfillment and joy. Over the past few years, best-selling author Daniel Pink has been conducting a study on regret. It includes over 19,000 responses from people across over 100 countries. And through their research, they found that there's four core regrets that people tend to have in their lives. And one of those regrets are what are called boldness regrets. If only I'd spoken up. If only I'd taken the chance. Oh, if only I'd gone for it. If only I'd had the courage to live a life that I wanted to live, a life true to myself, not the life that everybody else is expecting me to live. And in Dr. Danny's words, if only I'd made it count. At that point in my life, I started to make some changes, to stop silencing myself, to be braver, to unmute myself. I started seeing a therapist regularly. My husband and I started going on couples retreats to learn how to connect and, and communicate better. I started asking for help at work, which was terrifying. But I did it, and I survived. And I even found the courage to, to leave my corporate job of 13 years and do the thing I always wanted to do that maybe didn't make sense to everybody and become an entrepreneur and start my own business. But there was a part of me that I kept silencing. It was the most alive and free and vibrant part of myself from the time I was really little, but I didn't let anybody else see it. For as long as I can remember, I have loved to sing, but never in front of people. I was not a performer. I would sing by myself in a room with the doors closed, making sure absolutely nobody could hear me. I wouldn't even join the choir in my high school because you had to audition to get in. And the idea of having to sing in front of another person was so terrifying to me that I was like, I'm out. No, thank you. And I sat in the audience all four years listening to them sing, wishing I was up there with them. But something changed when I came back from a semester abroad in Spain, my junior year of college. I found the courage to try out for a solo at the gospel choir concert. And I was in the gospel choir because you didn't have to try out. So... <laughs> Anybody who wanted in was in, but if you wanted a solo, you had to try out for that. So I waited until everyone left rehearsal one night. I was nervous, and I was shaking. And I went up to the director, Eric, and I told him I wanted to try out for a solo. And he sat down at the piano and sent me to the microphone, and I closed my eyes, and I sang. And when I finished, I looked over at him, and, and he, he got up from the piano. And he knocked over a music stand, and he said, where did that come from? 
about 15 years later, I was telling that story to a group of about a dozen of my peers at a professional speaker training that I was at. And we were sharing bits of our speeches, and I shared the story of the audition. I sang a few lines of a gospel song, and I felt like something was missing. And so I turned to my vocal coach, Darcy, and I said, um, but I feel like I'm holding myself back. Um, yes, I do too. Um, what's the lyric again? This morning when I rose, I didn't have no doubt. Uh-huh. Um, and what does that little phrase mean to you? That. That is what we want. That is what we want. Now, my voice teacher always said, forget the notes. Sing the intention. These people are here for you. They have your back. I have your back. You just go. You sing that intention. This morning when I rose, yeah, I didn't have no doubt. This morning when I rose, yeah, I didn't have no doubt. This morning when I rose, yeah, I didn't have no doubt. This morning when I rose, yeah, I didn't have no doubt. That's all you needed to do. <laughs> That's your truth. You tell the truth when you sing. You do. It's who you are. That's what you have to do. You can't be afraid. Well, you can be afraid all you want, but you just have to do it anyway. You understand what you have to do now? Yesterday, my husband gave me a card after our dress rehearsal. It said, she who is brave is free. It's brave to start acting like your voice and your thoughts and your needs and your feelings and your wants matter just as much as anybody else's because they do. So stop silencing yourself. It's costing you too much and it's robbing you of connection and freedom and joy. Here's to being brave and bold and courageous. Here's to showing up authentically as ourselves. And here's to making every moment count.